Oh, hello, everybody. I think, well, let me share with you some ideas of what is going on in the world now, where we're coming from, where we go, and what are the solutions, what could be the solutions. Uh, to be frank with you, if I will ask you, what is your feeling of life now? You will say that there is an element of uncertainty. We open the TV, we see terrorism, we see somebody is killed, we see a lot of people they are not happy. And despite that the world's economy is growing, and we don't see satisfaction. Believe me, this country is maybe in a more or less good economic conditions. But believe me, there is a big uncertainty in other parts of the world. What happened? So this is a small point of view where I will try within 20, 25 minutes explain you my point of view, my understanding of the problem, why it is like this. And to understand it's going to be deepened or it's going to be solved. Or we are going to see more explosion, more killings and things like this. 30 years ago, in Syria or in Iraq, nobody was killing each other. Nobody was killed because he is Christian. Nobody was killed because he is Shiite or he is Sunni. What happened with the world? So, on the one hand, we are getting more clever. Don't forget, nowadays, within three years, we are creating information what we have created before these three years, within 3,000 years. And why we are, not, we are not getting clever? Why we are not acting clever? Well, so this is a certain economic point. Well, this is very small chart showing that how an average world tariffs have been decreased within something like 22 years. So we remove the tariffs and we have got free flow of goods and services. That the, was the basis of a global economic world. So a unique market for goods and services. Goods and services started to move. But, but when a commodity is moving. The job which creates this commodity is moving too. When you are producing some commodity, you are investing, you are putting there your culture. And when you are exporting that, you are exporting your culture. So, that, that was a good chance at the first point of view to create the conditions for a good life. In a result, we had the WTO just being for, for nowadays, except Cuba, North Korea, practically most of countries are WTO members. And, and their decision was that really we're happy with this WTO. We are making trade good services, but the political tensions Tensions between nations started to rise up. Why? Uh, we have to keep in mind, when we started to move commodities without any barriers within the countries, the chances of 
separate countries to get advantages were different. So usually, I don't know if there are economists among you, usually worlds and economics considers from two parts. Microeconomics, which concerns to the farms, companies, how to build the job in order to get more profit. And macroeconomics, which is contradicting with microeconomics. Macroeconomics says, be careful with your profits. It is the not only result what we need. We need also taxes. We need also to pay pensions. We need follow up for the inflation, for the interest rates, etc., etc. Be careful with that. And you know that macroeconomics, this division happened at 1934, when four famous John Maynard Keynes wrote a book. Nowadays, to my opinion, there is a place, there is a room for mega-economics. So we have microeconomics, macroeconomics, and mega-economics. Because when we, when we did it, we opened the road, we opened the doors for everybody. And here, and here, we started to realize that, look, there is also mega economics. There is also a mega space when you have to be, behave with the certain rules. And the first body to my mind was WTO, created to manage trade between nations. Now, turn to the other point, point of view. This is the distribution of the world's population. You know, just a thousand years ago, world's population was 300 million people. 2,000 years ago, world's population was again 300 million people. But nowadays, we are already 7 billion. What happened? You see that this is a how we call, mathematically, this is an exponent, you know, is getting sharper and sharper the increase of the world's population. We are living in the times when it will be doubled within 45, 50 years. And the problem here is how this increase of population will be distributed among different civilizations. Well, here I put on the chart uh, religions like, like an evidence of a civilization. Of course, it's uh, conventional. It's not, you cannot uh, too, much, uh, too much rely on it, but in any way, we see that when 100 years ago, by example, we had five times less Muslims than Christians, now they are very close together. Keeping in mind that the roads for goods and services are free, such a distribution of population should or will bring this situation when whether the people have to move or resources have to distribute it. For example, this is distribution of population and land. Uh, uh, on your uh, On your right, you have population. On your left, you have land. 70% of the land is under the control of Christian population. So, this is the first. Secondly, resources are less and less. Resources of gold, by example, all mines, 
Thank you. Are exhausted? Of course, for in the case of oil and gas, we create some alternatives, but it's a temporary event. We have just our globe, and within this globe, resources are limited. Resources are limited, but population is doubled each 45, 50 years. What should be, or what will be the solution? Uh, just I'm, I would like to say to you that uh, if we take living standard, but by example, the richest country in the world, which is Liechtenstein or Luxembourg, and compare that with the poorest country in the world, which is Burundi, the difference is 780 times. Which means that in Burundi, 780 employees, in summary, have the same salary that one employee in Luxembourg. No. It is not the case in terms of education. Education is very unique, very dynamic. Education and culture, they can be improved without too much improvement in the economy. Uh, by example, and here we, you can understand why things happened in Ukraine. Per 10,000 people in Ukraine, we have almost two times more students than you have in Germany. In Ukraine, you have a lot of students having very good education, but at the end, they know that they're going to wash cars because they won't find a job. Because the economy doesn't need such a high quality, such amount of high quality personalities. But I'm asking you, if you are an Ukrainian with very good education, having, do not having proper job, or ha you have this job, but uh, the salary size or the remuneration is very low, what you are going to do? You are going to move to the other country, yeah? Exactly. This is the mega economics. You have two solutions. Or capital should go to Ukraine to create factories, jobs, economy, etc., etc. Or Ukrainians will come to the capital. This is what we are what we are watching by TV. Intervention of different migrants to the Lesbo Islands or to the Lampedusa, etc., etc. This is exactly Mecca economics because you create one world for resources, for, for goods and services, but you want to stop resources. This creates tension in the countries, is the living standard is too, uh, uh, is not in a high level. And they would like to get the living conditions. Of course, the question mark here is, but did they earn these living conditions? This is the formula which shows that uh, uh, marginal, um, uh, pro uh, marginal productivity of each factor of the, of the economy, they should be equalized. In order to be able to equalize that, you have two choices, two choices. Whether you create jobs, by example, in Ukraine, where you find a lot of educated people, and they want to have a freedom, they, have a, they want to have a modern life, constructed like it is in Western Europe, or you have to see a lot of Ukrainians, millions of Ukrainians coming into the Europe. The same with Ar Armenia. And the same with Arabic countries. In some cases, it creates terrorism. It creates political movements. But behind that, you should see that something has to be changed in the modern world. Uh, well, we, we, we were, uh, I've looked at that. Tendencies, how these people will Will, uh, where we see a lot of migrants, 
And where is the problem? For example, uh, we are examining in terms of use different economies in the world. Uh, well, Switzerland is the most efficient economy in the world. Using oil per one dollar, they can produce products per, for ten dollars. But in Turkmenistan, or in Togo, or in Russia, using product oil for one dollar, they are able to produce only two dollars products. Then again, it should be distributed. If we are a global world, if we have one home, our globe, uh, a very interesting issue was realized, tendency was realized last 20 years. As you know, a lot of South Korean, Chinese, not Japanese, not too much, but these companies are very, uh, very successful in the international markets. And when we started with some universities to research the situation around these countries, companies presenting Korea and China, we discovered that they are very flexible to the religion. They don't care what type of religion you have. In South Korea, well, they can be married in the Christian church, they can be Buddhist, they can be Muslim. And I started to realize that it's an advantage for them. For them, it's make, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't mean that we should do the same with Christian countries, no. But just an example, as just, a, uh, uh, just an example to think about. Well, what's going on on our uh, further life? Oh, well, a couple of new, new issues that we, uh, which are too important in terms of mega economics. This is the American economy. Uh, really, we can be in agreement that within the last 50 years, it, it has been changed radically. In the United States nowadays, financial corporations are making as, as an absolute amount two times more money than the companies in the industry. That was not the case 50 years ago. That was not the, uh, uh, and you know that the financial companies, this is a, the, just intermediary institutions. And the, uh, and the main aim is to produce goods and services for people. And after that, to consume these goods and services. What's going on to happen with that? What's going on to happen with that? Having 70 million trillion dollars of GDP in the world, we have 700 trillion turnover of the financial corporations. In this case, can we say that, by example, GDP is the right figure to characterize the volume of your production? Not at all. Not at all. It doesn't mean anything. Or it doesn't mean too much. Or sometimes we are saying that for a small countries like Armenia, be careful with your exchange rate. Keep it floating because as far as you have a deficit in trade of balance, you are going to lose. Of course, when you have a dollar or euro or Swiss franc like this, your currency could float. But when dollar and uh, euro, they are swimming themselves, what is the solution for you? Or, well, this is explanation. For example, this is a, a demand curve aggregate. You know, usually macroeconomics says if you have a, uh, if, if demand increases, prices are going up. Uh, if prices are going up, demand is decreasing, and prices are going down, demand is decreasing. Not in all cases. We have a lot of cases when price increase brings to the increase of demand. And this is the result of the mega economy. Because on the level of the world, not on the level of the society, macroeconomics, not on the level of separate company, microeconomics, on the level of the world, it could happen. 
That is why this special part of economics we called mega economics, with special rules of management, with special laws to be introduced. For example, mm, uh, this is the distribution of income in the world, in the society on the left, on the left chart. You know, it's, we call it Lorenz curve, you know. It should be like the black one, but in fact we have the situation in the world on your right side. Because in mega economy, the curve has the shape of W, very often the poor in rich countries are richer than the rich in poor countries. So this is fact. And this is fact. This is totally, totally, totally new event. Or labor demand in mega economy. It says in macroeconomics, you increase the salary, you will get increasing supply. But in mega economy, you increase the salary, uh, or you decrease the salary in macroeconomy, you did decrease the supply, that's why you, you should think what should be, for example, a minimum wage in your country. But now, when you have a flow of migrants, it's time to think that the equilibrium, you have, a, as a minimum, two points of equilibrium. So this is, these are thoughts which I would like to share with you. And at the end, I would like to add something on terms of Armenia and what is going to happen. So this is distribution of the world's economy, with economy, not the population, between, between different Uh, between different religions, yeah? So as you see, there's a big advantage of the Christian world. But in terms of population growth, there's a delay in the Christian world. So that means that sooner or later, we have to share what we are producing with the others. Because they are human, human beings. They are, uh, they are inhabited in one globe. We are the citizen of a globe, you know. You want, you don't want, you should do it. If you don't do it, that creates a, some kind of tension, terrorism. Or have a look what's going on in terms of political, political um, uh, structure of the world. We have more than 7,000 languages in the world. We have 1,300 nationalities. We have 193 nations and 240 from 170 to 140 language families. And the number of the state is doubled each 100 year. 100 years ago, we were something like 60 states in the world. Now we have 190. It's going to be in 100 year from now 300. That we have to understand. We cannot avoid this situation. So, and at the end, those types of civilizations, saying civilization, I mean, so the combination of social institutions, of structures, individuals, and religions. So we have Western civilization, the last one, where there is domination on in individuals. We have Orthodox civilization, mainly it's a Russian civilization. Here you have a domination of the state over the religion, over the individuals, over the social institutions. In the Western civilization, we have domination of individuals over the state, religion, and social institutions. You have Islam, domination of the religion, and Sharia here is the dominating rule how to organize the society. And you have what we call Far East, China, Korea, etc., etc., where there is a domination of social institutions over the states in the individuals and religions. And you see, we are different. Despite we create one unique world, 
We are very different in different parts of the world. So, that creates seven geopolitical centers. What is the task in these conditions? What is the task for Armenia? You see this small country, old country, officially uh, uh, among the existing states, the first Christian country in the world. Historically, it was the second, but the first one was Australia, who is, doesn't exist now. And where they have to look for their future, for their happiness, you know. South and West and East, we have a Muslim countries. On the North part, we have a Georgia, another old Christian country, number four, and then we have Russia. And we have creating, we are being in such a region with a lot of tensions. We think how we diversify our culture in order to be ambassador of Christians among Muslim countries and to be ambassador of Muslim countries among Christian countries. And like this, we are trying to create our economic life, to organize it, and so on. So, Armenia is, a, as a country, is a little bit less developed than the average country in the world. Here you can find the database of for the wars and for the Armenia. Oh, here it is in Ukraine, but we did that for Ukraine, such research. Uh, uh, main advantage for a country is that, in fact, country is on a crossroad of the different civilization, and the task of the country is how to use this location in order to bring positive results to our neighbors, in order to bring results for ourselves. And how to find the solution against these increasing tensions, especially coming from, uh, uh, especially coming from uh, Sunni, Muslims, Arabic parts, because finally uh, uh, such a tension in this part of the planet is connected that people there, they would like to see redistribution of resources. And our task is, but how to help them to increase this production of resources, which will alleviate the situation there and which will decrease tension in the world. This is the main idea. This is the main philosophy. This is the, uh, the main principle of the mega economies, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bagratan, for having enlightened to us uh, one of the most famous speeches that actually he has had. Uh, I think we have a wireless microphone. I'd like to introduce Captain Hanson. Uh, Captain Hanson, you can start with that. We have a wireless microphone. And then, uh, Mr. Bagratan, we can hear it with the microphone. But this is your chance uh, through the Ask Questions. Please comment, debate, discuss anything that Mr. Bagratan may have said or that he didn't say. Uh, you can take advantage of this opportunity. I'd ask you to raise your hand. Hello, um, my name is Georgos Yalamidis. I am from Greece and uh, thank you for the keynoting. Uh, it was amazing. I'm an economist and uh, I would like to ask you um, all this, um, all, all the speech reminds me uh, the Adams theory about the wealth of nations and also the competitive advantage of Mr. Port Porter theory. So I would like to ask you one of the most questioned uh, theories in uh, economics about what your theory, what the mega economics um, propose regarding the, uh, the way the wealth of nation is produced and uh, how must be distributed during the next years when all this instability will be increased. Thank you. I'm going to say to you strange things. Oh, of course, thank you that 
I'm following up the principles of Adam Smith, or you say it, uh, Porter. Well, I respect them. I was a student using these books, so I like you, you know. Uh, and thank you for the question. I don't know the answer to your question, but I know one thing. When we create, by example, custom union, when we pushing on the European Union's special restrictions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are creating tension. I do believe that we have to develop the positive experience that we had on WTO. Of course, for a short term, when we are creating a barrier in Lampedusa, I can understand that. But it's not a solution. It's not a solution. I do believe that the world's religions, Muslims, Christians, like it did Henry VIII in 16th century, they have created new basis for tolerance. We cannot continue like this. Being an Armenian, I know what happened with Armenians in Syria. That's a terrible. With the same story we had 100 years ago. But now, when 100 years ago, you can say, OK, this is Armenia very far from us. But now it's not the case. It's coming. That is why I do believe that the way to move is liberalization of the connection, limitation of uh, uh, the reduction of limits during the connection. I do believe this is the strategic principle. And I do believe that there should be big tolerance. We should respect each other and step by step to integrate Christians and Muslims in some worlds. Otherwise, look what's going on in Africa. It's only 1.5 billion. In 20 years, it will be 3 billion. And mainly Muslim population is growing up. And these people have to find the food. They have to find a job. That's why I do believe the direction. How to choose that? How to move? I don't know. OK, we have another question. I'm coming. Hi, my name is Alvaro. I'm from Spain. Um, I was pretty so interested by your theory, theory about redistribution of wealth at the international level. And I was wondering, because you were president of Armenia for quite a few years, how do you use this theory of mega economics to make your society in Armenia more equal and more fair? Thank you. Well, in fact, I'm already out of the government 20 years. I'm trying to do that, to use it. Well, right now, I'm, as a politician, I'm a member of the parliament, and I'm still persisting to, to use some elements on that. And my task is to fight against increasing polarization of wealth. Uh, if you are more interested in that, please read Paul Krugman's books. Paul is unbelievably on a high level on that. And you can find a lot of useful things there. Well, what I'm trying to do in Armenia, well, we cannot be happy. There is a big polarization. But maybe if, if there was a no chance for us to have an influence, maybe it, it would be worse than it is now. Everywhere, I'm not a socialist. I'm liberal, by the way. But everywhere, I'm saying that our task is not to say that you have to have the same living condition. No, but you have to have a, you have to try to create the same possibility for everybody. For everybody. And, and that's, that's, that's the philosophy. But in more details, you can find uh, in uh, Paul Krugman's books, nice books, uh, what is the tendency and how to overcome the problems.
Thank you for the answer. Do you have more questions? Comments? Okay, then I have a question. Um, since we're here discussing cultural diplomacy, and um, maybe you could tell us more about how Armenia in the um, years after the Soviet Union collapse dealt with uh, um, cultural um, like promotion of its own culture, going abroad, like since you traveled a lot, I'm sure, and there are many people from the country living abroad. How do you, the country, was there any maybe strategy or any uh, plan for that, and what steps were made to promote Armenian culture abroad? Dr. First of all, thank you for the question. Well, immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have got a problem of Nagorno-Karabakh. There was a small region with autonomous status in Azerbaijan. These people, the territory was inhabited by Armenians, they don't want to, to, be, to continue to live with Azerbaijan. Also, there was a tension. Armenians were Christians, Azeri people, there were Muslims. Unfortunately, we have got a, we have got a military uh, resistance there. On top of that, as you know, we had a historical problem of genocide connected with Turkey. But in any way, I think we can say that one thing was successful in Armenia. You don't, when you come here, Yerevan, you won't see any Armenian hating any neighbor. We remove this complexity of that we were, we have been killed 100 years ago. Let's go on to think how to, uh, to, uh, to turn it back uh, for revenge, etc., etc. What was successful during the last 20 years, I think, well, I don't, well, I hope it's not an exaggeration, but I think we are ready for a full integration. So, well, I don't think that we hate, we, hate, we are a little bit snobs, but I don't think that we hate our neighbors. That's a really very important for us because we had so problems with them, so many problems. And you have to be in Armenia to understand what it means to be, to live in this such a crossroad. But anyway, that's our life. We la like our country. And uh, uh, I think now we are ready. We don't have a problem, complexes to communicate, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we, we don't do nothing special. One thing was done uh, continuously by, by my government and by the, the existing government. There is no... Uh, phobism uh, in terms of religion, in terms of neighboring countries, and that's good. That's good. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, okay, I see one. Hi, I'm Carla and I'm from Australia. From? Australia. Um, I'm just wondering if you are trying to redistribute wealth into countries that don't have any infrastructure. Could you speak louder, please? Sure. If, you don't, uh, if you're trying to redistribute wealth into countries that have limited infrastructure, how are you making the wealthier nations do that? Infrastructure what? Infrastructure what? If, they, if their countries don't have or have limited infrastructure. So, infrastructure. What is infrastructure? You, you should create it. We are working on it, on the energy sector. Uh, of course, for time being, roads with Turkey are closed. We hope that one day it will be open. We are preparing railway from north to uh, south, which is connecting Georgia via Armenia to Iran. Well, on to one day, maybe one day, uh, roads with Azerbaijan will be opened. I do believe, I hope that uh, within the next two, three years, we are going to find uh, some acceptable solutions, elements of solution with Azerbaijan. And with Turkey, we have no problems now. We Armenians, we have no problems. Because 
we are ready to open it. We declared. And in Turkey, you can see that the um, uh, uh, public mood is rising up, you know, to do that. But we are creating infrastructure. It's not the end of the world. You can easily get Armenia, you know, so it's not a problem. Hello, and thank you again for this speech. That was very interesting. My name is Adrian, and I'm from France. I was just wondering, like, all the wars in the Middle East, as Armenia being the first Catholic state, do you fear, like, some threats coming from the Islamist people, some terrorism in your country? Not yet. Not yet, but we see that. It's coming. It is not in Armenia for the time being, but it's coming. Hello. Uh, well, I just want to know from your own words if you can give us your own definition about cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy? See, si. with your own words, yeah. Oh. Thank you. Well, if you want to find some samples on cultural diplomacy, Armenia is a good case, and Armenians are a good case. Well, uh, we, we, we were suffering as a nation uh, uh, having very dramatic events in our life. Uh, but what is the end? What is the end? We lose people, we lose country, land, etc., etc. What is the end? The end is understanding that in order to build a relationship, you have to understand the cultural value of those people with whom you would like to build a relationship. That's a very important thing. Don't come to them saying that, look, I have a different culture. It's a better or it's not better. Take it, etc., etc." I think the Armenians understand something during these 2,000 of years of relationship. And we were suffering a lot. And I can tell you that that mm, we don't have any unique case building relationship, successful life, successful relationship via war. No, not at all. Well, this is what I think about the cultural diplomacy, uh, respect others and they will respect you. Yeah, um, most presidents nowadays, for example, Obama in the US, they emphasize how terrorism is one of the biggest threats nowadays, and also nuclear weapons, and especially in the hands of terrorism, of terrorist groups. But in your opinion, what do you think, at the international level, in terms of politics, what do you think is the biggest threat to the world right now? Thank you. Unfortunately, what happened in the world with the terrorism, that happened. People have been killed. Dramatic events in the different parts of the world. Uh, but I, I don't see that. Uh, so we, we go there and we are killing terrorists. You kill them, tomorrow you will get more. I see the process that it will be evolutionary process. For example, in Syria, they will be remapping of the country. The same is going to happen in Iraq. 
from the part of Europe or from the part of Armenia, what we have to take care, it is how to be presented culturally to this organization, not to these organizations, but to, to these societies. Uh, step by step, it will go down. Step by step, all barriers against trade, against communication, against production, against, against movement of resources should be removed. And in such conditions, we will be able to elevate the relationship with them. I just see these key developments. Uh, we can be in agreement that any, any intermediary actions realized in Libya or in, uh, in Egypt, etc., etc., they were not, they were not efficient. So, I don't see revolution here. I see evolutionary process. Well, when we talk in Syria, why that happened? After all, in Syria you have a, some specific weight of Sunni population and some specific weight of Alawi population. Among Sunni, demographic growth a couple of times was higher than among Alawi population, and at the end, it brings to such event like Isil. Of course, Isil is a very wild form of expression of political moods, but at the end, it will become softer, and it will bring to the remapping of reshaping the country. Thank you very much. Any other additional questions? Yes, Sergey, please. please. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you, um, we are talking for a better distribution uh, without polarized uh, proportion of wealth to, any, to anybody. And uh, I would like to ask you if you believe uh, that this all thing, this better proportion, better distribution could be happened since we are living in a capitalistic world and all the distribution is the outcome of the free market's equilibrium and uh, the proportion is more or less st standardized. So how can we distribute it differently since the outcome is already happened or it's uh, uh, decided by the free market? Well, thank you. Thank you. Very sophisticated <laughs> question. Uh, yes, I do believe that, uh, you know, we do not, we don't need to reject free market. But of course, we have to think how to control uh, distribution, how to avoid these wild forms of polarization. I agree with that. That is why in the political life, you have liberals, you have socialists, and they're fighting, it's normal. There is no problem there. They should fight. But this is clear, like gentleman asked during the, 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 uh, the last question, and as it mentioned by very famous economists, that the increase of polarization is disturbing in the world. Equalization is zero. It will bring, it will bring to the zero economic results. But let's realize that the polarization is too much. And all the time, there are ways to control a little bit. To not kill entrepreneurs, but to not squeeze vulnerable people. Additional questions for the former prime minister of Armenia. 
This is your chance. It's not every day we can uh, discuss these things. Uh, and I always say at ICD, we're so often in our daily routines, in our individual offices, this and that, that it's, I think, exciting for us to have the chance to really discuss these issues. One thing uh, you may have discussed while I was out of the office, you and I discussed this a little bit over lunch, uh, how cultural diplomacy perhaps could serve as a vehicle uh, to assist in sometimes tense bilateral relations. Uh, and if you spoke about this already, ignore it. But it's just a question that I thought was an interesting thing. For example, Armenia-Turkey. You know, what can cultural diplomacy do to help? Uh, we also discussed the issue Macedonia, Greece. What can cultural diplomacy do to help? We could also theoretically look at, let's say, Cyprus, Turkey. You know, difficult issues where one has different layers of history going back. I don't know if you have the answer. I don't have the answer myself. But do you think that cultural diplomacy can contribute uh, to a situation like that, where it's really a very complex tension at the political level, at the economic level? Can culture do anything? Or is this just the job for the politicians and the economists? Oh, well, the last month I told you I was in Turkey. I was in some cities, small cities. You don't know them, former Anatolia region. That was my former, when, when Armenia was formed, my nation was formed. I was walking in the cities. I, I met some Kurds, you know. And they started to invite me for a cup of coffee. And I was there with 15 or 20 Kurds. And Mr. Donfried, my question was, well, well, they were like common people. I asked them, what do you want in your life? What is your aim of your life? To find somebody to kill or what, what is the aim? The values, values. When we are talking about the mega economics and global economics, the values are going to be globalized. That's for sure. That means let's find a common language, similarities between Christians, Muslims, different cultures. And here, the roots are cultural. Well, you cannot express that in the language. You cannot. And, uh, and we had a, a small ensemble, dancing ensemble, dancing old Armenians, medieval Armenians dancing. And this course came saying that, look, it's so similar with us. What can I tell you? You know better than me. This is the only way to communicate. I see the war. We had the war. And there is a war over there. I haven't seen any case that the war solved such type of problems. So I agree with you. I think culture in terms of this, uh, what we have in common. There's the famous saying, politics demonizes, culture humanizes. So I definitely agree with you. I think in that sense, of course, that's maybe what connects us, you know, in terms of really our traditions, our values, etc. I've had fascinating conversations with Muslims, Christians, and Jews. We can talk about prayer. We can talk about pilgrimage. We can talk about forgiveness. Uh, and there's so much in common between the, the faiths. So there I fully agree. Let me throw a provocative thesis out there. I'd love to get your reaction. I've discussed this already with some of the students. I have a thesis that I think culture diplomacy can even contribute with a challenge as great as terrorism. And people say, Mark, what are you talking about? Terrorism. Nobody can stop terrorism. How can cultural diplomacy do anything? My thesis, however, we can make it, I think, more difficult for the extremists through cultural diplomacy. For example, bin Laden, I would argue, bin Laden was actually an expert of soft power. He didn't pay anyone to fly into the World Trade Center. He didn't force them into flying into the World Trade Center. He attracted them to his interpretation of quote-unquote religion. Uh, you could argue Bush Jr. did the same in the USA. <laughs> he attracted the Americans to vote for him again, assuming the elections were legal. He attracted Americans to this idea, this is a crusade, the axis of good against the axis of evil. So you could argue that's soft power. So what can cultural diplomacy do? What I would say, let's make it more difficult for the next Bush Jr. Let's make it more difficult for the next bin Laden. When somebody comes and says, I mean, for example, I'd love to chat with you about your thesis there as well, Western civilization. Is there a Western civilization? For me, it's a question. Islamic civilization, is there an Islamic civilization? I also don't know. Uh, but I think that's where cultural diplomacy, I'd love to get your reaction, I think can help. You know, let's make it more difficult. As soon as somebody says, all Palestinians are like this, or all Israelis are like that, or all Armenians are like this, all Turks are like that, let's challenge them. And I think that's where cultural diplomacy maybe could help, you know, just through education through exchange. You know, the more experience I have with Turks and Armenians, the harder it is for someone to tell me, all Armenians are like that, all Turks are like that. What is your thought there? You know, in terms of really exposure rating, raising awareness, can cultural diplomacy contribute? Or uh, what, what are your thoughts of this provocative thesis, cultural diplomacy and terrorism? Is, is there something to that? Yes, look, 
in this institute, in this university, imagine that you bring some young people from Syria or from Iraq, just having one, two, three months uh, learning on the cultural issue. They will be changed. Once a friend asked me, what is the history of Armenians? You know, very interesting thing. In this world, each nation is writing its own history. But in, nobody is saying that we were wrong. Some things we don't, we were not doing well. And my friend asked me, what will the best, what should be the best history for each nation? I started to say that, to my mind, the time will come. And we will see that Armenians are not writing their history, own history. We are writing history, writing history for Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan, Georgia. Georgians are writing history for us, for Azerbaijan, for Russia. Because, because this will be the ideal way to move. Uh, I'm sure that the next 12, 30 years, uh, people will find the language, a common language, between different religions. Because it's, tension is too high. Tension is too high. Uh, uh, because uh, Christianity based on the law. For example, Muslim religion based on tradition. Should we find a way out? There should be solution. And people are working on it. People who can do an efficient job there. What is our task, what is my task? Just to call everybody to be in agreement with the process. And that's it, that's all. And maybe that that's why some people are realizing that is going to be a coherency between different wars. Let, do not allow that. Let's create some terroristic groups, et cetera, et cetera. You know, then again, you have it. And uh, yes, the issue is that next 20, 30 years, we are going to have years of tension. But at the end, I do hope, we are not going to be involved in the nuclear world. We are going to have a common language between everybody, and it, it will be created. No, I share your optimism. I will have a few comments on what you said, but I'll skip it for now because I'm very happy to say a brief introduction for the ambassador who just joined us. So I have one more question for you, Mr. Bagratin, but before I pose it, I would like to ask everyone to please give a warm welcome to the ambassador of Armenia to Germany who's just joined us. Could you please stand for a moment? Uh, let's say a brief welcome. Thank you. Hey. Your Excellency, we're very happy to have you here. We have a meeting uh, just after today's talk where we're going to discuss a number of issues where we're collaborating with Armenia. You probably saw the big Armenian Economics uh, Forum uh, taking place later this year. Uh, and that's actually part of the question I wanted to ask you uh, to conclude. Nation branding uh, is a term which became very well known, uh, particularly from a British scholar, Simon Anhot, uh, who wrote a lot about this idea of nation branding. At the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, we find the idea of nation branding very interesting. Even though I differ somewhat from Simon Anhalt in terms of how it could be d defined and actually implemented. For us at the Institute, I would say one of the big problems countries have in the world is that there's actually very often three different lenses, so to speak, of, of perception. You have the reality of the country is one thing. The second thing is the way the country is presented abroad. The third thing is the way the country is perceived abroad. And so often, those three things are different. <laughs> a country is perceived one way, presented another way, and the reality is something else. So for us, when it comes to nation branding, and this is related to our upcoming events uh, taking place in Yerevan, I wanted to ask the question to you, do you think, again, a cultural diplomacy-based version of nation branding can assist? Uh, what is nation branding for you? And can, let's say, a more comprehensive uh, way of looking at nation branding also assist in terms of building economic bridges and political bridges? Uh, for me, I think the real thing cultural diplomacy could do in the framework of nation branding is to assist, to correct maybe misperceptions, uh, increase partial information, uh, and to try to create a fuller picture. Yes, Armenia is A, B, and C, but it's also D, E, and F. Uh, and I think there, that's where maybe cultural diplomacy can fill in some of the blanks. Uh, to take the way, for example, Armenia is presented abroad in certain countries and certain regions, the way it's perceived, and the reality. What are your thoughts? Is, is there a potential there in terms of nation branding, or is nation branding just basically 
be buying advertising on CNN, as in the case of Dubai or Croatia. What potential do you see for cultural diplomacy based nation branding? Mr. Dronfried, why we are in the same, in the same wagon? Why I came here for the cooperation with you? For me personally, just frank, to be frank with you, we have one problem. My nation has one problem. My nation, my nation had very difficult history. I want to break this image. I want to you to see in Armenia coming and saying that, look, Armenians, you want us to be with you? You have to be able to give something to us for exchange. But don't give us your problems. This is the main lesson for my nation, you know. If this forum, coming forum, an event in Yerevan, in October, will assist to overcome this, that's good. And I, I'm sure that we are going to be successful. And always by television, by different media, uh, uh, by television, newspapers, TV channels, etc., etc., I, I, I'm repeating that Armenians, it's time to think what you can give to Iran, by example, if you wanted to have a good friendship with them. That the modern world, mega economics, is exchange. Everything is exchange. You wanted to, to get something, you have to give something. In this case, everything will be successful. This is, well, this is, uh, this is my idea, you know, that this is uh, a little bit personalized, but I do hope that partially or fully it's shared by the government, by the state officials, etc. No, well, thank you so much for those reflections. Uh, I think on that note, we should conclude. I don't want to keep the ambassador waiting. We have our meeting. But thank you again very, very much, uh, yeah. first of all, for having come. Uh, we see the cooperation with you, the cooperation with the government of Armenia as being very important for the ICD. We also do see a great potential uh, in the sense of nation branding and beyond, where I do believe, sincerely, culture diplomacy can assist. And I think together with the local experts that you're bringing together for us, we can really have an impact. And I really appreciate you, you sharing also your knowledge and your experience with all of us. Uh, it's not every day we have a chance again, to be with someone of your great experience uh, and also uh, the honorable career that you've had. So thank you very much, Mr. Bagratan. I would like to ask everyone to please join in expressing our sincere gratitude for the excellent lecture and the talk that followed. Thank, thank you, very you much. everybody. Thank you.